The history of Duke Energy, in many ways, is the history of energy production in America. From hydroelectric and fossil fuels to nuclear and renewables, Duke Energy has established a legacy of innovation, entrepreneurship, and resolve to power a nation and the lives of its people. And while technology's changed, as did our country, one thing has remained constant. The vision Duke Energy's founders set forth long ago to safely, reliably, and affordably meet the energy needs of our customers, no matter the challenge. Today, we'll discuss the defining moments and innovations that have characterized our company and made us who we are today. Unfortunately, we can't cover our entire 120-year history here. Instead, we'll walk through five defining chapters that shaped the company. Our story starts at the beginning of the 20th century, the early days of our company. The term startup hadn't been invented yet, but that's where we were, going from a bold idea to a sustainable business in our first 25 years. It was more than just a new company. It was the dawning of a new industry, and it came with all the ups and downs you'd expect creating an energy company from scratch in the early 1900s. Extreme weather, fuel challenges, and new rules and regulations. The South's economy was still recovering from the Civil War and heavily dependent on agriculture. Poverty was rampant and the region lagged the North in nearly every way, including wealth, literacy, and academics. Unlike the North, the South's heavy dependence on agriculture and lack of access to electricity were prohibiting the growth of other industries. But three men, the founders of our company, saw opportunity. The three included a visionary surgeon, a brilliant engineer, and an entrepreneurial businessman. The first was Dr. W. Gil Wiley, a native South Carolinian and renowned New York surgeon. He grew up in the Catawba River that flows across the Carolinas. The 220-mile river inspired his interest in hydroelectric power and how it could transform the region. But he wasn't interested in scattered power plants servicing one city or a major factory, as was done in the north. No, he envisioned a series of hydroelectric plants on the river using interconnected high-voltage transmission lines to serve a large region instead. So, in 1900, he created the Catawba Power Company, the forerunner of Duke Energy. Wiley knew that to get his vision to work, he needed technical expertise. This led him to our second founder, William States Lee, another native of South Carolina. Lee was an outstanding engineer who would bring Wiley's vision to life. In 1904, they finished their first hydroelectric plant in the Catawba River in South Carolina. This first generating asset marked the birth date of our company and the initial step in creating a truly integrated electric system. But for that to happen, they needed a different kind of power, capital. Which brings us to our final founder and company namesake, James Buchanan Duke. Buck Duke was a North Carolinian who in the early 1890s founded the American Tobacco Company, which once controlled over 90% of the U.S. cigarette market. Duke and his family also owned a textile firm in North Carolina. Wiley's plan resonated with Duke. He felt that the development of hydroelectric power would draw industries, such as textiles, to the rural south and reinvigorate the economy. In 1905, he invested $8 million, more than $250 million today, and transformed the Catawba Power Company into the Southern Power Company. They then began building more hydroelectric plants. And by 1907, textile mills in the Charlotte area used more electricity than all of New England. As the company's fleet of plants and electric grid grew, so did the opportunities. But that success had its challenges, starting with weather, an ever-present threat in the energy business even today. It started with back-to-back -back tropical cyclones in 1916 that dumped unprecedented rain and caused devastating floods that ravaged the region. Locals called it the greatest flood since Noah and is still one of the worst natural disasters in the state's history. It knocked many plants out of service for up to five months. Then, just a few years later, came a severe drought. A serious problem if you're relying on water to generate electricity. It forced the company to curtail service underscoring the need for another fuel source to offset the unpredictability of the region's climate. Buck Duke had a solution. 
On his deathbed in 1925, he authorized Lee to put the system in shape to meet any possible contingencies arising from weather. That meant diversifying our resources. And that meant coal, an inexpensive, abundant, and highly effective fuel. Once again, Williams states Lee delivered and coal became king. Lee built the first coal plant of its kind in the South and one of the first in the nation. It established a reliable power source that could be turned on or off whenever needed, no matter the weather. That's the definition of dispatchable, which is still important to this day. The Buck Steam Station was a marvel. Built in just nine months, it began operation in 1926, and its technology was superior to anything available at the time. It consumed 1,200 tons of coal a day, and its boilers were the size of a six-story building. But it was just the start. The company kept building more coal plants to keep up with significant demand and to mitigate the impact of weather. It wasn't long until we began using coal to meet our baseload needs, only turning on hydro during peak energy usage. We continued to add coal units to our system until 2012, and it remained our biggest generation source for around nine decades. Another challenge our founders faced was navigating those early years of regulation, which remains entwined in the industry's operations today. Utilities such as power and water are typically natural monopolies. The high costs of infrastructure, generating stations, transmission and distribution lines and more mean only one large company can efficiently and effectively provide service to a given area. It takes a lot of capital to run them, and if left on their own, companies would first serve urban areas where they can recover their costs faster rather than serving rural and low-income areas. So, the new energy industry needed a certain level of oversight, which is why in 1913, North Carolina formed the North Carolina Corporation Commission. Its role was to ensure that utilities could recover fair costs while protecting customers by limiting the utility's profits. This relationship was great in theory, but it wasn't truly tested until 1920 when we needed to recoup flood restoration costs. To say it was highly contentious is putting it lightly. The battle played out in the local papers for weeks, one side representing the agricultural eastern portion of the state and the other championing the interests of the rapidly industrializing region. By then, the company had invested $47 million in North Carolina alone, more than $647 million in today's dollars and the earnings for the previous five years had not even reached 5%. The company won a victory in that first-rate case, but the outcome was meager. Buck Duke finally had enough, especially after investing so much of his own money with no personal return. He issued a rare public statement in 1923 in which he said he would spend more money to build more plants, but not if the returns remain at their current level. Otherwise, he was through. Southern Power won their next rate case in 1924. In addition to approving an appropriate rate, the Commission declared the power company was acting in good faith to supply a service for which there was an ever-increasing demand. That same year, we acquired the Watery Power Company and changed our name to Duke Power Company, cementing our company's place in the Southeast's history. With a rate victory in hand and a new name, we were positioned to move forward into the Roaring Twenties. The 1920s saw rapid economic expansion, and Duke Power was up to the challenge, building new generating plants to keep pace. In some years, volumes grew by over 15%. But then came 1929, the stock market crash, and the beginning of the Great Depression. Just as extreme weather and regulatory challenges defined our early years, economic volatility and our ability to adapt to it defined the next chapter. We had to navigate through our country's worst economic downturn and then its greatest period of expansion. These economic extremes created new challenges and opportunities for the company. Boon times went to bust as the depression had a tremendous impact on our customers, our communities and our company. Industrial production dropped by more than 50% in North Carolina. Cotton and textile wages declined by 25% and one-third of the state's residents were on relief due to lost wages. Industrial use of electricity plummeted, the most important segment of profitability for Duke Power. But we stayed committed to the people we served. We waived minimum charges for power because of mill curtailment. 
We worked alongside mill owners to help keep factories open and unemployment down. And when all the banks closed in one North Carolina town, we loaned an industrialist $25,000 to open a new bank. But we didn't stop there. We introduced new products and focused more attention on residential, municipal, and small business customers, opening up growth opportunities that remained important even after the depression ended. We concentrated our efforts on making electric appliances more available, including refrigerators, toasters, fans, and other items that made life better. We even applied our expertise to start an agricultural engineering department, electrifying the poultry industry and then moving to dairy farming and forestry. Despite all that we achieved, it was still a devastating time for the company as construction of new generating plants was halted. We could only look to the future with hope for an economic turnaround. That came with the start of World War II, as factories were retooled for the war effort and industrialization accelerated rapidly. But it was the post-war years that really changed everything, as the country experienced one of the greatest economic booms in history. Across the country, energy consumption increased 36%, GDP almost doubled from 1940 to 1950, and the demand for electricity was unprecedented as refrigerators, range-top ovens, and TVs became middle-class staples, not to mention air conditioning. In the South, the economy really soared. The region's population increased by 14%. Personal income nearly doubled. Economic contributions from industry tripled, and the number of industrial workers grew by more than 50%. To answer the needs of an energy-hungry region, Duke launched a mass construction program that continued into the 1960s, building new and even larger coal plants, as well as our last economically feasible hydro plant in the Catawba River. Altogether, in the five years following the war, Duke Power spent about $200 million on new plants and necessary equipment. To fuel that growth, Duke Power ended a 60-year period as a private company and began trading on the New York Stock Exchange. It was a time of great optimism. But there was a sense of change in the air. Hydroelectric was built out. A new environmental movement was taking shape that would impact our coal plants. And the peacetime use of atomic energy was about to usher in the next era of Duke Power's history. The age of nuclear was upon us. It began in 1953 with President Eisenhower's Adams for Peace speech before the UN, where he outlined his vision for civilian nuclear energy. What followed was a three-decade expansion of commercial nuclear power, with plenty of ups and downs, but one of the most important in our industry because it gave us one of our most important assets, our fleet of nuclear plants. Construction on our first nuclear plant, Oconee in South Carolina, began in 1965 and came online in 1973. More than $7 billion was spent to bring 7,000 megawatts of nuclear energy online. At the time, it was the world's largest nuclear power plant, capable of powering 1.9 million homes. Oconee's success led to construction of two other nuclear plants, McGuire and Catawba. Our efforts to produce carbon-free nuclear power were applauded by the public due to its growing concern over the consequences of burning fossil fuels. Overseeing our nuclear efforts was a familiar name, Bill Lee, grandson of one of our founders, William Statesley, a brilliant engineer like his grandfather, Bill Lee excelled at the challenge and would later go on to become the CEO of the company. But as successful as our nuclear program was, the headwinds of the times were challenging. Recession, double-digit inflation, rising interest rates, the sheer cost of nuclear plants, and a reluctance by regulators to allow rate increases all put tremendous pressure on Duke Power. Despite it all, the outlook for nuclear remained strong. More than 100 nuclear plants across the country were either complete or on order. But things were about to change that would shape the future of nuclear energy. On March 28, 1979, the most significant accident in U.S. commercial nuclear power history occurred at the Three Mile Island plant in Pennsylvania. The nuclear fuel core melted, there was a release of radiation, and the unit was permanently damaged after only 100 days of operation. Fear, confusion, and sheer panic paralyzed the nation for days. Since Duke was operating two similar nuclear units, Bill Lee and several hand-picked employees rushed to the scene. 
joining 2,000 scientists, engineers, and others to help bring the overheated reactor under control. The benefits of nuclear power were soon forgotten, and the public was quickly losing confidence. The industry responded quickly, and Duke Power led the way. Bill Lee became the face of the nuclear industry, and he understood that the failure of one could mean failure for all. He led the industry to create the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, a self-regulating organization focused on excellence, not just compliance. The success of these efforts saved the existing industry in the U.S., but the damage was done. Following the accident, general anti-nuclear sentiments started to rise, as did regulatory and economic uncertainties and difficulties attracting capital. Three Mile Island marked the end of nuclear expansion. In its aftermath, 67 of the 100 planned builds were canceled. For our company, we finished the plants we had under construction and acquired a few more through mergers. But we'd never break ground on another new plant. Despite the struggles of the nuclear age, our nuclear stations today are the most valuable and irreplaceable assets we have. Our 11 nuclear units make up 80% of the carbon-free power we generate at Duke Energy. And simply put, we can't reach our climate goals without them. That's why we have such an extreme focus on safety and operational excellence and are seeking to extend the licenses of our plants another 20 years. The road to financial recovery from the nuclear era took years. It wasn't until the end of the 1980s that we were once again experiencing moderate earnings growth. But there were new challenges and opportunities ahead as an undercurrent of deregulation began to surface in Washington. An era of competition was upon us. In the 1990s, a wave of deregulation swept across the airline and telecom industries. There was also enthusiasm around deregulating the generation of electricity due to high costs and a desire for consumer choice. It caused seismic changes to the power business, turning what was once a steady, predictable industry into a more volatile one. New opportunities and risks arose, and Duke Power would soon experience both extremes. Duke Power embraced deregulation wholeheartedly. Deregulation opened wholesale and retail markets to competition and let U.S. utilities invest and operate globally. Our confidence and success in building nuclear, along with our strength in engineering, allowed us to enter these competitive markets as a generation constructor and owner. And the best way to enter these new commercial markets was through natural gas, which was becoming increasingly popular due to technology breakthroughs. But we needed to bolster our gas capabilities and our trading and market expertise. So in 1997, we merged with Pan Energy, a natural gas company, and changed our name to Duke Energy. We were now one of the country's largest energy companies and would soon be operating in 25 countries and six continents. Deregulation led us to California, the first competitive market to open in the U.S. Its push to deregulate in 1996 was an attempt to lower its very high energy rates, and it fundamentally changed the state's power industry. California was one of the places we were making the most money. We had more than 5% of the state's entire market. Total company revenues grew by 20%, and we shot up to number 14 on the Fortune 500 list. Things were going very well. Then on a 103-degree day in June 2000, Around 100,000 customers in the San Francisco Bay Area experienced a rolling blackout. This was the beginning of the California energy crisis that would last through much of 2001 and have ripple effects for decades. Capacity shortages caused prices to skyrocket by a factor of 10 and led to a series of major blackouts that would plague California for the next year. They affected people and businesses and created economic and public health issues. One week of outages alone had a $2 billion impact on the state's economy. Essential services such as drinking water, food safety, and health care were affected. The impact on Duke Energy would be equally dramatic. As prices spiked, the bulk power system collapsed, residential bills soared, accusations of price manipulation increased, and investigations soon followed. Duke Energy was swept up in this investigation. Overnight, we went from hero to villain. Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, filed for bankruptcy, and Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric were on the brink. And then Enron fell. It was found guilty of improperly using complex accounting practices to boost cash flow and inflate earnings statements. 
the blackouts were truly a perfect storm event. The California merchant market was dismantled and deregulation lost its allure. For Duke Energy, we entered with the best of intentions and denied any wrongdoing. However, at the end, we had a lot of unwinding and rebuilding to do after this event. That started with simplifying our strategy and getting back to the basics. Over a span of 15 years, we took key steps to transform our portfolio and get back to where we started, a domestic regulated energy infrastructure business. In 2004, we sold more than 3.1 billion in assets in the Southeast, Asia Pacific and European regions. We then exited Duke Energy North America, selling non-regulated generation and foreign businesses to focus more on our domestic regulated core business. We became one of the largest energy companies in the country through mergers with Synergy and Progress Energy and spun off Spectra Energy, our natural gas transmission business. We later acquired Piedmont Natural Gas to get more firmly in the growing local distribution side of the gas business. The moves proved successful as we once again became a regulated energy infrastructure business. This meant better value for our customers and predictable, stable earnings for our investors. The end result is the Duke Energy of today that brings us the last chapter, leading the clean energy transformation in the electric industry. Leading the way requires the kind of company Duke Energy is today, the second largest energy company in North America, a top five solar developer, a top 10 wind developer, an industry leader in safety, the largest regulated nuclear operator, an operator of the largest electric grid in the country, 300,000 miles of lines, and one of Fortune's world's most admired companies. We are focused on aggressively reducing carbon and methane emissions, not only as part of our climate strategy, but as part of our business strategy as well. We will reduce carbon emissions by at least 50% by 2030 and achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. We are building for the future on a strong foundation. So far, we have achieved a 40% reduction in carbon emissions from 2005 levels and will direct $125 billion of capital toward clean energy over the next decade to keep that momentum. In the coming years, we will double our renewables portfolio by 2025 and triple it by 2030, add energy storage to our system, complete the largest closure of coal plants in the industry, reach net zero methane emissions by 2030, extend the life of our nuclear plants, champion R&D investments to get net zero, advocate for an appropriate pace to transition to cleaner energy, maintaining reliability and affordability. We are committed to these goals while maintaining the reliability our customers count on and the affordability that will maintain the economic health of the communities we serve. Addressing climate change is just the latest bold step Duke Energy has taken in more than a century of service. From those early years of turning the Catawba into America's hardest working river, to then transitioning to coal, then nuclear and natural gas, and now wind and solar. If history is any guide, the next era in Duke Energy's history may be the most interesting of all. Through economic booms and busts, regulation and deregulation, Duke Energy's commitment has never changed. We have the same dedication and entrepreneurial spirit that Dr. Wiley, William Lee, and Buck Duke instilled in the company over a century ago. Then, as now, we're prepared to shape the future for the customers and communities we are privileged to serve.